is the parable of lost things. It's the parable of the, the sheep lost, the coin lost, and of course the son lost. So this is really one parable in three different parts. And in this parable, we see the heart of God. We see the heart of God, the son, especially in the, the lost sheep. Of course, Jesus is our good, great, and chief shepherd. I believe we see the Holy Spirit in the lost coin. The Holy Spirit working through the church to seek and to save that which was lost. But here we see our loving Father, our perfect Heavenly Father. What is God like? Actually, this, this part of the parable shatters myths that people have of God. We see in this parable how God seeks the lost. He seeks the lost aggressively. He seeks the lost optimistically. You know what's encouraging about this parable? Is everything that is lost gets found. Nothing remains lost. Maybe except for that Pharisee son at the end. But we have hope for him. He, sees, he seeks the lost compassionately. So with aggression, aggressively, compassionately, and optimistically, God seeks the lost. May we so. Seek the lost around us because many are lost. Many need Jesus. You know, I got a, a message from one of the chaplains of the fellowship that I'm with, and he just said, pray for my son who came to New York. He's away from God, and he's doing things. You know, and I thought, wow, there's a son, like a prodigal, coming to this city, and he's afraid for his son, and he's broken for his son. There's many people to see you never know when you see somebody on the in the subway in the bus on the street why they're here and what's going on in their life but there's many people to seek and save for sure in our city well let's read this passage luke chapter 15 verse 11 and he said a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father and i underlined these next two words what are those next two words give me give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and went and sent him, and he sent him into his fields to feed Swine, that's like the lowest of the low for a Jewish boy, right? And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. Now, of course, swine are unclean animals in the Jewish culture. And so not only is he taking care of the swine, but he would eat their food. That's how hungry he is. No man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now, what are the next two words there? Make me, before he said, give me, and I have those two underlined, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And he was yet a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Please read verse 24 with me. For this my son was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment now. Lord, speak to our hearts about who you are. For you are truly, O oh, our great perfect heavenly father, you are the hero of this story. 
And may we see you tonight as we come to you in prayer. Teach us to pray, Lord, and teach us even to turn this parable into our prayers tonight as we come before your holy presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just want us to see four things about our perfect Heavenly Father tonight in this beautiful story. And this story shows us how God deals with us in our rebellion. And I want us to see ourselves tonight as the prodigal in coming to our Father. So the first thing we see about our Father is He is a patient Father. He is so patient. And this parable explodes a myth that God is some kind of irate judge. That he loves to destroy and brings bring judgment upon somebody. You know, the moment they step out of line, you know, he has that pitchfork blazing with flames. You know, pow, stepped out of line. I want to get in. Here we see the father so patient. What does he let his son do? Exercise his own will. His, his son says, I don't know if I would have done this if I were father, actually. Dad, I want my inheritance now. I'm, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to wait till I die, you know. But he says, give me. What belongs to me now? And this father let his own son exercise his will. And our father, in love, lets us do the same. And he let his son go. And the father put himself in a place of waiting. And I understand that as a father. You do have to, at a certain point, let your children go. And they will make decisions that can break your heart. I think if you're a parent, all of us have experienced that. And so... This prodigal tosses his father's values to the wind, and the father can do nothing but exercise patience and to pray for his son. So, of course, this boy went into a far country, and that far country is also described a little more specifically in verse 30. We didn't read that, but verse 30 says, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. That's a sure way to devour your living. It's through sexual immorality. That will bring a person, the, the law of God says, the proverb says, to a piece of bread. And that's what happened to this prodigal. He hit the bottom. So the progression is his willfulness led to waste and led to absolute, absolute want. When you willfully run and say, give me, I want to do my own thing. You go your own way. Willfulness leads to waste. He wasted his substance. And then that led to want and need. And this father does nothing. He doesn't wire his son money. He doesn't bail him out of his situation. He lets him experience the pain of his poor decisions you know parents sometimes just want to bail their children out <laughs> of all the messes they make but sometimes a parent just has to wait and let them feel the pain of their own sins and the consequences like someone as well said you make your choices but then your choices make you and you can choose a direction and you can choose to sin but you don't get to choose the consequences of that sin and the Bible speaks about if you sow to your flesh a sin you will reap corruption you will you will reap what you sow so this father lets his son even hit the bottom and this is the bottom of the bottom for a Jewish boy I've heard it said that sin will always take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And then sin will make you pay more than you thought you'd ever pay. And that's what this boy finds out. There he is. Man, have you run from God? I remember running from God. I was a prodigal. Thank God. I hit the bottom. I'm thankful for that bottom. I, I don't want to forget the bottom, you know. I don't want to forget the the pain of that bottom. And I want to, I want to, I don't want to be like Israel, you know, when they came out of Egypt. They didn't remember the bottom. They didn't remember the chains. 
They didn't remember the slavery and the whips. What did they remember when they came out of Egypt? They remembered the cucumbers. Yeah, they're <laughs> like, where are the cucumbers? What, what do you mean cucumbers? What about the chains, you know? Isn't that how the devil works in a person's life? We need to remember the pain and the bottom and the, the husks of sin that we ate because of our rebellion against God. This boy lost control. Like Jonah, he started to make those decisions to walk away from God. And then all of a sudden, Jonah lost control. He was like down in the bottom of the, of the Mediterranean, out of control. That's what sin leads a person. But when things are out of our control, they're not out of God's control. So we see a very patient father here. Not an irate judge. He's a patient father. The second thing we see about our father is not only is he patient, but he's consistent. We see a consistent father. God is not unreliable. That's the people think God is fickle, you know, and he's inconsistent. You don't know how he's going to act from one day to the next. Oh, we God is he is faithful and reliable. And he says, I am the Lord. I change not. And so the son realizes this about his father. When he's there, oh, desiring to eat what the pigs eat, he wakes up. <laughs> he comes to himself. He wakes up. And he says, I like that in verse 17, when he came to himself. You know, sin causes people to just lose their mind. And, and not be their real self that God made them to be. When he came to himself, he said, wait a minute. My father has servants, and they've got bread and more than enough to spare. I could eat the crumbs off the table and eat better than this. And he knew his father was still there. You see? He knew his father hadn't changed. He knew his father was stable. He knew his father was consistent. And so he reevaluates his situation. He comes to himself and he repents. Look in the verse in James, please, in James chapter one, if you could turn there. It's a great verse about our God. You have to wonder. This boy had such an incredible situation. I mean, he was a wealthy boy in his culture, even in the story. He walks away from it all to wonder what, what did he think he was actually going to find? But, you know, why would anybody walk away from God? God is so full of love, so full of grace. And yet we've all walked away from him at one point. But in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And for James, that ultimate gift that's from above is wisdom, James 3, 17. The wisdom that is from above, which is salvation in James' mind, I believe. He's talking about, really, he's ultimately talking about salvation and all the gifts that God gives to us through salvation. Every good gift and every perfect gift. And the ultimate gift, of course, is Jesus and salvation it cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning that word variableness is an interesting word and it literally is the idea of like when the moon gets in the way of the sun what is that called it's like an eclipse and james is using that picture here he says our god is a light a great light he is the father of lights and in him, there's no variableness. In other words, nothing can block the radiance of his shining and of his glory. Nothing can eclipse the light of God's love and grace. Nothing can block. There's no variableness. There's no change to him. He changes not. And nothing can block his Radiance or interrupt his radiance from those who come to him You know, it's good to know that God is reliable 
consistent. Because many, many people, they say this, you know, psychiatrists or others say this, that many people often, well, when you're a child, the first authority in your life, of course, is your mom and your dad. And many people, based on how their father treats them, often um, cast that kind of, project that upon God himself. And many people have fathers who are, well, all of our fathers are inconsistent to some level or another because our fathers were sinners. But some have fathers who are, are bad or even maybe abusive, and, and they don't know whether their, their father is going to uh, hug them or slug them from one moment to the next, or if, if their father's going to be silent or violent or tough or tender, or if the father's going to either accept me or reject me. In other words, fathers that are inconsistent. And we might think, well, our, our, our Heavenly Father is that way. No, he's not. Our Heavenly Father is absolutely true and pure and perfect and consistent. So this son realizes that his father is still there. He reevaluates himself and he repents. No longer does he have a give me attitude, but he has a humble attitude of, of turning to the Lord and saying to his father, I have sinned against heaven. You know, that's a good way to repent, by the way. Just repent. Not, if I have hurt you, would you please forgive me? You know, that's like a political repentance. <laughs> if I said anything wrong, would you please forgive me? Well, did you say something wrong? Just say, I, I have sinned. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes that's hard for us to do, but that's what he... He rehearses this in his mind. This is what I'm going to tell my father. I like this. In verse 18, he says, I'm going to tell him I have sinned against heaven and before you. And when he saw his father, what does he say? I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. He said exactly what he planned to say. So you know what? When you repent, think about it. And then do it. So he sees his father as consistent. The third thing, he sees his father as compassionate. Or we see our Father here as compassionate. Our perfect Father is compassionate. He is consistent. He is patient. Where do we see the, the compassion of the Father? Look at this. The boy rises. He goes. And when he was yet a great way off, verse 20. I love this. Don't you? This is why, you know, this story... Just think of this. This is the only gospel where this story is found, and yet how beloved this story is. It shows you the power of God's word. Now, we need the gospel of Luke for parables like this because we wouldn't have it if God did not inspire Luke to pen it. But anyway, when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. So the father's love sees the father saw him. What mercy. The father's love runs. What joyful energy is in our father. To run. You want to come to me? He's not running away. He's running too. It's not something. As we come to him tonight, we have to see our heavenly father is literally running to us to hear and to listen. And the father kisses with passion, his dirty, smelly, piggy, his piggy, his Mr. Piggy, not Miss Piggy, his threadbare son coming home, giving him a second chance. Someone has said he didn't need a sermon, he needed a second chance. And we see here that God is so full of compassion. Some people think that God is some kind of impersonal deity. This shatters that myth, doesn't it? You know, the deist idea of God is that, you know, he kind of wound everything up. He wound the earth up, and then he just let it all go. And obviously, there's so much pain in this world. We wonder sometimes why God does allow what he allows. But we have to see that our God is powerful, but he's not impersonal. He's powerful but very personal. He knows us, and he loves us, and he sees us, and he runs to us, and he kisses us in that spiritual sense. 
Look at this verse, please. Go back in Luke chapter 7. Just real fast. Luke chapter 7. This is the story where Jesus raised up the son of that widowed mother whose only son had now died. In Luke chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. In Luke chapter 7, God's word, Luke, Luke chapter 7, verse 12. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. This is our God. When the Lord saw her, God's love is perceptive. He sees. The Lord saw her. Do you believe God sees you? When you feel, so, imagine the pain she felt at that moment. She was a widow, her only son dead. They're going to put him, you know, they're going to bury him. But the Lord saw her. His love is perceptive. It says, he had compassion. Actually, that's the same word often used in the Gospels. He was moved with compassion. And when he is moved with compassion, he is moved to action. So we see his, his love is so passionate, much more passionate than we, we are, for sure, he, and, and much more passionate than we could ever imagine. And then his love is practical, because when the Lord saw her, he had compassion, and he said unto her, weep not, <laughs> even in that moment. Weep not, because I'm going to take away the very reason you're weeping. And you notice he commit what you know what I love about the story is he commanded her to stop crying before he raised up her son. It's like, wow, that's not so easy to stop weeping. Why, why do you want me to stop weeping? You see, he didn't even tell her at that moment what he was gonna do, but his word, his command really required a miracle of faith on her part to obey, to stop weeping. To trust. So that's the God we serve, who has everything under control, who says, weep not whatever you're going through, because he knows the end of the story. So he is patient. He is consistent. He is compassionate. And lastly, we see our father is forgiving. He is not an irate judge. He is not unreliable. He is not impersonal. And he is not unmerciful. He is forgiven. So notice the forgiveness here. What are the three things? Here where the father said to his servants, bring forth the best, verse 22, Luke 15, 22. Bring forth the what? The best robe. What does that mean? The best, that speaks to me of forgiveness. The robe of righteousness. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In order to be accepted by our Father, we have to be as righteous as His Son. And how can we ever be except by grace? That God looks at us as He looks upon His own Son when we believe in Jesus. That's salvation. That we have that forgiveness. A forgiving Father. You know, some people think, if I live for God, he is going to make me do something I don't want to do. He's going to be, he's so unreasonable or, or God is harsh. You know, it's, it, Jesus was actually always combating against that thought that people had in some of these parables. Remember the parable of the, 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 par, the, the talents? Remember the guy who had one talent? What did he do with his talent? Buried. He buried, why did he bury it? He, he said, God, it was precious no. And, and he says, yeah, because you're a harsh, though. You're a harsh. You're like a taskmaster. A lot of people have that idea of God, that he's, he's harsh. He's, he's, he's like a taskmaster. No, he is a forgiving and merciful God. He's not unreasonable. And here we see the Father bring forth the best robe. I mean, he didn't, did he deserve it? That's mercy, right? And then he says, put a ring on his hand. You know what that speaks of? Trust. So the robe is, I forgive you. The ring is, I trust you. Because you know what the ring is? It's like a credit card. He gives him the MasterCard. He's, he, in other words, his son who just spent all the money. But he's, he put a ring. That's like my signature, my signet. 
and you, I trust you. And then he tells his son, or then he, not, not his son, but he says, put a ring on his finger and put shoes on his feet. So the robe is, I forgive you. The ring is, I trust you. The shoes on the feet is, I'm going to use you. You're going to serve. And so they had a feast. Our God is full of forgiveness for us. Our God is a consistent and compassionate and patient God. That's the beauty of this parable amongst many other things. So as we go to him tonight, let's pray that God would save our prodigals of this city, of our church. We have prodigals in our church who run away from us. Pray that God would bring them to a place where they would even cry out, I have sinned, and I want to return back to my father's house. May we be willing and love to receive those who return, and then we will truly rejoice. Verse 32 of this chapter finishes, Jesus said, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you forgive us, that you use us. Oh, isn't that amazing, dear God, that you entrust us and you call us stewards, stewards of the mystery of the gospel. You have entrusted to us your very heart, the message of salvation, and said, go into all the world. That is great trust. On your part of us, Lord, help us to be faithful as your stewards. Thank you for who you are. That you're very patient and consistent. You're compassionate and forgiving. We love you, Lord. We praise you for your love to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Adrian will come at this time. All right, well, let's pray for our offering.